So what exactly do we mean by fusion development and what does it actually look like in practice? Well, stick around for the low code revolution today because I'm joined by Daniel McConaughey and he's gonna be talking about how his company have embraced fusion development and robotic process automation. Stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Low Code Revolution. I'm April Dunham, and today we're joined by Daniel McConaughey. He's going to be talking about how his company has used fusion development and power automate desktop. Thanks so much for joining us today. Daniel, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for this time. Um, yeah, so really quick, just to intro by myself, in case people don't know me. So my name is Daniel, obviously. Uh, I work at Tower Insurance. I head up the automation practice there. Um, and we're focusing on intelligent automation. Um, and one of the main things that we've started doing and having a lot of success with is leveraging the power platform, specifically Power Automate Desktop. So one of the first things that we started um, really wanting to, to, to change in our business was we were a general insurer, so we have a contact center, and my team was really tasked with looking at the claims area, so when a customer has an accident, they call up our call center, on how we can improve some of the what we call ACW or after call work processes. So anytime someone, a customer calls up, basically, obviously we have a great phone conversation, we finish the call and then the customer services officer will need to do some follow-up actions. So this time period could be, you know, it could be one minute, it could be five minutes, it depends on, on the, you know, the severity or the complexity of the claim. So what we really wanted to do there was try and reduce that time as much as possible because there's some manual and repetitive tasks in there um, that, really don't add any value to what we're trying to do. Obviously we want the phone the phone agents to be back on the phone as fast as possible so they can continue to serve customers. And a lot of these tasks aren't actually, you know, they're not fun for our, for our staff either. They're, they're, you know, like I said, repetitive, manual. So we, uh, you know, we'll obviously get into details later, but basically we started using Power Automate Desktop there. Um, we had some great success. Um, we saw a reduction in minutes. Um, you know, which is which is huge. It doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, when you've got lots of hundreds of calls coming in, that really adds up. And also, um, whereas I'm sure we'll talk about later, we saw um, our our staff be really excited and engaged about this 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 new tool that they had to use. That's awesome. Like, I love hearing stories of just real customers and people using the Power Platform to improve their business. And, you know, I think this is a really common scenario, right, where we have these customer facing situations and we have these manual processes that none of us enjoy um, to do. And then, you know, ideally, we want to have as much time in front of the customer as possible and have that be our focus than some of this mundane uh, manual stuff. So it's cool to hear that you all are leveraging the Power Platform to help with that. Uh, you mentioned Power Automate Desktop. So kind of curious, when you were trying to figure out, you know, how best to try to automate and improve this process, how did you land on Power Automate Desktop for that? Yeah, so we we had a previous stint of trying to get RPA, um, Robotics Process Automation, going at Tower a couple of years ago. I wasn't directly involved with that, but I think... Um, and what I hear a lot about um, RPA processes is the scope was slightly too big or they were trying to look at something that was very complex, which can be very challenging because obviously that translates into lots of decision trees that you have to incorporate in. Um, I think where, where it was kind of serendipitous because we, my team had already previously been looking at Azure Functions and Azure Serverless. Um, and then we saw that, uh, you know, Power Automate Desktop became, I think it was it was last year, or was became uh, available for free with Windows with Windows 10. Yep. So, uh, you know, we we and we had licenses um, through our through our E5 licensing. So we're like, all right, let's let's try this out. And I think the first thing that really struck me was, I, I actually tried it first. Um, I was because I'm usually I'm usually pretty critical to be honest. I'm pretty critical. I, I got a high standard. And it's about user experience. So I think the first thing that was great, I was like, okay, cool. So it's in the Microsoft ecosystem. That's great because we're we're predominantly in Microsoft shop first and foremost. You know, we, we, we use Office, um, we, we code in .NET, um, you know, our devs. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was like, oh, exciting. I can plug into and trigger these flows from say uh, office.com, some of the power automate cloud flows and things like that. So it's it was like, what I saw as native integration into the, into the Microsoft stack, which was super exciting for us. So uh, we 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 had a bit of a play in our own team. Um, got you know because that's where you know we have to be we have to be engaged with the product first. So I think one of my um, one of my devs he uh, 
He was like, I, I was like, what are you gonna do? He's like, oh, okay, I wanna automate doing my timesheet. And you know, I'm a manager, so I was like, ah, I'm not sure that's a great idea, but hey, you know, if that's gonna make you excited, do it. <laughs> and he did it, he did it like it did it like like 25 minutes. Um, so that was wow. that was that was that was pretty cool to see. Um uh you know, and so there we go, okay, cool. So first off, I see someone who's you know a developer and they're like they're pretty critical about these kind of things, and they were excited. So we started going um just some of our key context stakeholders and claims were like, look, we've got this. We want to try some stuff. Um, we we took like a business SME, like a subject matter expert, got them involved, got them playing, and we just started iterating on. We knew we knew about two problem areas that we wanted to try, and we just started trying them first. Um, so again, we saw the the business SME. They got really excited about it. Um, she she was like, wow, this is so cool, and. I know it's it's a little bit of a segue, but um, I've been in IT for a while. I've been a developer, I've been a BA, I've been a manager, and it's very rare to see people who don't code or don't do this stuff get excited, like really excited about technology. That's not something crazy to do with like your phone, like AI or whatever. So they were just like, she was just like, oh, this is so cool, and I was like, okay, <laughs> yes, this is good. I don't have to sell this. <laughs> this is gonna work. So I love that. Um, and you know, awesome. she, she did her own use case as well. Um, and that's kind of how we got started. So it was it was kind of organic, um, and you know I, I can say it was very it was a very strategic choice, and we we planned this from the start. But um, it was pretty organic, and I think that actually um, proves how good it was in terms of getting that engagement and buy in. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty typical for the Pirate Platform. It tends to be kind of organic like that. And I, I love hearing those stories where like it kind of sells itself, right? You don't have to mm. really get buy-in from from people sometimes because once you see the the power of it, no pun intended, um, it kind of <laughs> sells itself there. And kind of what you're talking about, which you know leads into really the the title or the topic of of what we have today is it sounds like you guys really embrace fusion development because you talked about you know having developers um, work on it, but also you know end users, business users that are familiar with the process. So really curious to get your take on, you know, we use this fusion development term quite a bit, it might be like a, a buzzword. What mm. is your feeling of what's fusion development mean to you? And what are some of the benefits that you saw from embracing the power platform and this kind of more fusion development approach in your business? Mm, that's a great question. So thinking about this, um, the first thing I want to touch on is, is about just continuing that engagement. So um, or buy-in. So um, obviously, if the people who are going to be using the tool are not excited about it, it's not going to work. And that's what we saw. We saw the Connect Center teams. Um, you know, we had uh, we actually we had David. David was um, well. David is still studying uh, computer science, and he's working part time in the Connect Center. So he's you know his undergraduate. And he had, so he's doing just like, a bit of exposure. He's like learning Python, learning Java, um, and we're like. Hey, here, have a play with this. And he, you know, he probably picks it up slightly easier than most people and he understands what we're trying to do with it. And then we also had, as I mentioned before, business SMEs who had no background trying this out as well. And then what happened was when David was doing the stuff inside his team, inside his pod at work, you know, people would be leaning over and be like, hey, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's this thing I'm working on. It's pretty cool. It's like my personal system. It clicks <laughs> buttons for me, it does this. And, you know, so we kind of get like, like I, I want to say like viral marketing in a way, like internal yeah. viral marketing, like people like, oh, can I get a license? You know, in like a month, people are like asking to get licenses assigned. And I'm like, man, I've got 50 licenses right now. Like, <laughs> I'm start writing up getting, getting budget to get more licenses, but which is, which is a, which is a great problem to have. Um, so that's kind of how that, that viral spread started going. And obviously, we were doing, um, you know, communications meetings at the same time. But I think that was a big key in getting success, especially in the claims area. So um, the other thing that I really want to touch on about fusion development or, you know, some, some people talk about citizen developers is that uh, my belief is that quite often in software development or whatever you want to call it, um, we, we can struggle to, or the main challenge is articulating and understanding what the customer or the user wants. Right, so we have one side, uh, which is the the IT side, right? So you got business analysts, you got developers, you got testers, you got whatever you want. And the other side are the people who are asking for things. And quite often, it's it's a game of trying to translate accurately. You might have seen like I've seen those memes on like on like Instagram and TikTok where it's like people drawing on each other's backs, and it's like <laughs> developer drawing and then like the tester draws something else and yeah. the draws something else. You know, this is that challenge, and that's because we're speaking different languages, right? So you know, developers are speaking code and. I often say to people, um, some of our devs, like, you want to be a really good dev, you need to be able to speak 
you know, translate that really, really easily to, to clients. So what I saw with the fusion development was that that side, the, the business side, if you will, they were they were learning the same language, if you were, because right? it's low code. So, you know, they're dragging boxes and they're clicking and selecting, um, you know, the, 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 the fields they want to enter in. And that means that you start having like a common terminology and a common pattern to talk about. And I thought that was really powerful because they start to run into problems or they start to see things that we had already, you know, and this IT best practice, right? Technology best practice we've seen for a long time. Like, um, you know, they're like, oh, wait, so if I want to reuse this over and over again, I don't want to have to, you know, uh, write, you know, copy this section over and over again. That feels, you know, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. Like, yeah, that's right. You know, we should template or, you know, um, in, in traditional object or in programming, you should be, you know, creating a reusable method and all these kind of things. So those kind of principles really helped us, um, I think, start to educate on traditional IT software delivery as well. So I know that was that was quite convoluted. I hope we got the point across, but um, it's just really that common terminology and like we're all part of the same team. So yeah, that's part. We're delivering together. They're not, we're not serving them. We're not like here, take our service request and we'll deliver it to you. They're part of it. So they're engaged. They're, you know, bought into the end result. Totally. It's all about, you know, breaking down silos and, you know, building That's out right. your development team, right? So you, rather than just having your traditional developers, you're really expanding the team to accommodate for business users and IT pros where you can all work together to really, you know, solve the challenge and, and the business goals that you have. So that's all the fusion development spell. And it's really cool to hear these stories of it working inside yeah. of companies. Yeah. And, you know, um, they were excited to call themselves um, developers. They're like, oh, I'm a developer. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you are. Let's go. I'm like, it's, it's so cool. Totally. I mean, you know, there's so many, so much terminology, you know, like professional developer, traditional citizen devs. But at the end of the day, we're, we're all developers when you're building solutions like this and mix and matching, you know, low code mm. and full code technology. Um, so, you know, when we start talking about power platform and low code and fusion development, you know, something that always comes up is, are there any, you know, challenges that you face? There might be some assumptions about low code. There might be even some, you know, people that might be a little bit scared about it. You know, when we talk about RPA, for example, you know, or are you automating yourself out of a job and like different challenges and assumptions? Is, is it scalable and all that? Did you run into any of those challenges or assumptions when you were rolling out these processes and implementing fusion development? Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So um, on the on the and I think this comes up a lot in different types of intelligent automation discussion, which is the um, you know you're automating something. Uh, you know, is that gonna is it gonna replace me or replace my job? So I think the the most powerful thing to do there is to focus on the individual that you're having this discussion with or this group of people and be like, what is it that you actually are doing? What, why, why are you doing this job? You know, they and in this case, our case, they're there to have great conversations with customers and in our, in our field when, they, when something's bad happens to them, right? So they just had a car crash, you know, maybe their house is burned down, you off a bit. Um, and where we want to use that is we want, them to be specialists in empathetic conversations, right? So the robot's not going to do that. So we start, you know, we start breaking down, you know, if you think about that time, you know, the amount of time they're spending on a call, like this is the part we want. We want to have really great conversations there. And this part at the end where you're just, you know, doing this, this monotonous stuff, that doesn't, that's not you being a specialist. That's not you, you know, you're not excited about that. So what we're going to try to do is minimize or remove that. And I think when you start to shift it to enabling them to be better at what they're doing, you know, that everyone gets excited about that, you know, might even use the term like, hey, it's like having an assistant that's going to go and do stuff for you. Um, you know, that's also really exciting for people. So um, I think it's really about how you how you talk about and communicate what you're doing rather than just give it like, you know, sort of having it done to them, like, just, hey, we're going to do this round. This is our automation strategy. We're going to do this. We're going to put on top and we're going to save all this time, blah, blah, blah. Like that is when I think, you, you know, you're not really engaging the people in the right way, at least in my experience. So I think that really helps on that side. The, the probably the bigger challenge and we, you know, we still face this challenge sometimes as we're rolling out to different divisions in our company is um, we've talked about how excited people are, we've talked about how engaged they are, showing them the power of what they can do, you know. Um, it's about having the right guardrails in place so that it's done, it's, it's so safe and secure without stifling that creativity, that, that, that engagement. Um, and that's obviously, um, I think in the low code area is probably like one of the, one of the hardest things to do. And it's a balancing act. Obviously we know it's a balancing act. Um, it's something that I think you probably are going to be 
evolving on over time. I don't think you reach a point where you're like, yeah, it's perfect. And, you know, stop. Yeah. I think it, it's going to change each time we do it. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's probably the, the biggest challenge we had. Um, and I, I think we've done, I think we've done pretty well. We can definitely improve. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm running through some situations in my head and I'm thinking about it. I was, I'll just vocalize it. So it's just, it's just, you know, like obvious things that you take for granted, um, potentially as, as IT professionals, you know, humans tend to, we tend to trivialize or we tend to take for granted a, the journey we go through to become proficient at something. So maybe you've had like uh, security training as a developer, right? You know, like, obviously we, we all know, like, don't put your password in a notepad file or, you know, that's a really common thing for people to understand about passwords, but, you know, talking about maybe you're being PC, maybe you're PCI compliant, maybe, you know, you don't want to store credit cards in a certain way, maybe, um, you know, you know that by copying a clipboard now that's in memory, you know, stuff, this is outside my realm of expertise, but those kind of things, um, we can take for granted how we learned that. And I think what we need to do is to not just put the guardrails in place, but it take everyone, all those citizen developers, all that fusion development team on the journey of why these things exist and why it's important. And I think security teams have traditionally done this very well, um, especially when talking developers about, you know, this isn't about limiting you, this is about enabling you to have a safe space, right? So, you know, obviously we've got sandbox environments and things like that. I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge um, that, you know, we came across. Yeah, and that all ties into, you know, what we talk about with uh, establishing a center of excellence. So that's kind of mm -hmm. what that all falls into, right? It's not not trying to cause barriers into mm -hmm. being able to use the platform, but just putting in, like, as you mentioned, the guardrails and a, a center of excellence to abide by and, and stay within for the solutions you build so that they are secure and they're scalable and, and all of that. So, you know, it's, that's, I think that's kind of tying what, what you're saying there and really important to establish that um, when you consider rolling out um, and it's establishing a fusion development approach uh, for sure. Um, mm. So this has been like an amazing talk. So I have one last question for you. Um, if you could do anything differently, what would it be? And actually it's a double fold question. And what are your future plans, anything um, in the horizon that you're going to do with the Power Platform to automate um, any more of your processes? Sure. Um, the challenge is question. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, always, <laughs> it's always a hard one. Um, I think it's probably just doing certain things sooner in the life cycle. Um, I think in hindsight, I would have loved to have engaged our security team a lot sooner, um, our infrastructure team who, who you know, wrap around our cloud services and just also get m myself and my team a better understanding of that whole um, security structure, if you will. Um, and just just that, those discussions taking place sooner, I think would have, would have been a lot um, easier for us rather than, you know, we, as we're going along, we discover something and we have to make a, a guardrail around it. So I think having those discussions earlier and maybe even taking the security team through the tool, um, like in that engagement thing, like what I was talking about is and getting them engaged with the tool right when we were getting the business users engaged probably would have been um, a much a much smarter move. Um, and that's definitely something I would change if I went back in time. Um, <laughs> going forward, look, I, I, I hinted that we're rolling out to different areas of the business. Look, we've got finance interested. We just had a conversation with underwriting. Um, so these are, you know, insurance functions. Um, and they've, you know, just, they used to call them back office functions that, you know, they have processes that they also have the manual and want to, they've heard about it, they've seen it. Um, we've done a couple of one-off uh, exercises with them. So in the new year, we're definitely going to be um, expanding more on that. Um, and also we've started, well, we already had a bit of a play with your, uh, uh, timesheet power app template, April, just a shameless plug there. Um, so we've been using that a little bit and I think we really want to start looking at power apps and, and, and sort of sharing with, with, again, with business users on how they can create, you know, an app, um, from say a spreadsheet or, or a SharePoint list. Um, I think that's really cool and exciting to give them that graphical user interface, but, um, yeah, we'll be tackling that in the new year. Awesome. It sounds like a lot of great things in store. And that's the beauty of the Power Platform is all the integrations and how everything kind of works together seamlessly. So once you start using one product, it's natural to, mm -hmm. to explore off into to other ones. So um, thank you again, Daniel, for joining us. For everyone out there watching, if you're curious to learn more about Power Automate Desktop, um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, there is a free version included in Windows, but also you can get a free trial if you go to aka.ms forward slash PAD for Power Automate Desktop and start trying it out today and just getting an idea for how you can leverage your bottom process automation to automate your processes. 
Thank you so much for joining us today on the Low Code Revolution, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>